each of you on the Sabbath to untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink, then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for eighteen long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all of his opponents were put to shame. But all those in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things he was doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the authorities asked Jesus, what's the hurry? Pointing to the formerly bent over woman, they said, why couldn't she wait? It's against the law to, to heal today, so do it tomorrow. It's just one more day. As though they really cared. I mean, after all, hadn't she been standing there, bent over for 18 years? So according to their logic, that's 5,000 634 days she could have been healed, but no one cared about this woman with no name. No one saw her until Jesus saw her and healed her on the wrong day. Now, they would no doubt scoff to hear that they were uncaring. I mean, how dare you accuse us? And, and they would claim to be the victim themselves, not her. We care deeply about her suffering, but if she wants healing, she needs to wait and do it legally. The story made me think of the 1963 Birmingham campaign that sought to bring national attention to the efforts of local black leaders to desegregate public facilities. On April 3rd, a series of actions began. Lunch counter sit-ins, sit-ins at the library, kneel-ins at churches, marches on City Hall and the county courthouse, and a boycott of downtown merchants. Eight clergymen, and I say that specifically, eight clergymen issued an appeal for law and order and common sense, published in the local paper, which read in part, we recognize the natural impatience of people who feel their hopes are slow in being realized. Emphasis mine. But demonstrations to realize those folks, to gain their rights, they said, are unwise and untimely. Adding that when rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiation among local leaders, not in the streets. On April 10th, the city obtained a state court injunction against the protests, and two days later, on Good Friday, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested for violating the anti-protest injunction and placed into solitary confinement for 10 days. While he was sitting in jail, Reverend King used the margins of the daily newspaper to scribble a letter to that group of fellow clergymen. And in what I consider one of his most brilliant writings, known as Letter from Birmingham Jail, he asked why the clergyman deplored the demonstrations, but not the conditions that made them necessary. The clergyman blamed outside agitators for riling up the local population, unconcerned that they would need assistance with their cause. The clergymen were unhappy with the demonstrators' willingness to break laws against mass gatherings, but then why? Did they refuse to obey the Supreme Court decision to outlaw segregation in public schools? I mean, why one law and not the other? Reverend King asked. And he expressed frustration that the Ku Klux Klan wasn't their greatest stumbling block. But the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another person's freedom, who constantly advise us to wait until a, quote, more convenient season. It was a similar sentiment in a letter written to King by a man in Texas which read, all Christians know that colored people will receive equal rights eventually. But is it possible that you are in too great of a religious hurry? So you've no doubt heard pieces and parts of the letter from Birmingham jail before, and I'm sure that I 
read the whole thing at some point in the past, but I read it all this week and just saw so many similarities with the gospel text. Jesus was told to wait until it was technically legal to heal, citing laws about Sabbath observance. And he asked, why is it okay for you to untie a donkey so we can drink water on the Sabbath day? But it's not okay to untie this woman so she can be free from her bondage. And remember the words, freedom from bondage. It's a key to understand their interaction. So we may be most familiar with the concept of keeping Sabbath holy from the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. Honor the Sabbath because God rested on the seventh day. But Jesus was referencing a second list of Ten Commandments in the book of Deuteronomy. Now they're the same commandments, but in this case, why one was to keep the Sabbath holy was different. It's not because it's the seventh day, but it is tied to the freedom from bondage. So it says, keep the Sabbath day holy, because remember, you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So Jesus wasn't disregarding the law. He reminded them of its entire interpretation. He wasn't saying the law is uncaring, but that its interpretation was too limited. Jesus noted that the observance of the Sabbath was to commemorate the freedom of slaves from their bondage in Egypt. Therefore, freeing this woman from her bondage is completely in line with the intention of the Sabbath commandment. Now, I don't know that everybody realizes that there are two sets of Ten Commandments, even though they're the same in two different places, nor that there are subtle differences between them, such as Sabbath. What if keeping Sabbath, would you feel differently about it? If keeping Sabbath what wasn't just about rest, but about liberation from that which holds us in bondage all week. So just think about what holds me in bondage all week? And the, the commandment says, take a day off from that every week. Huh. That'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I want to stress a very important dis distinction before we go on, because sermons on this text and many others can easily stray into anti-Semitic tropes about how the law is legalistic and the gospel is about love. Not true. It's a slippery slope from a character assassination of the synagogue leader to an accusation against all Jews, and from that charges of disloyalty retweeted from neo-Nazis. In fact, it's something I had to take into careful consideration when talking about Dr. King's time in Birmingham jail. I don't want to compare Bull Connor and the rest of the segregationists with the synagogue leader. Rather, the, the similarity I want to suggest is that insincere misuse of law to keep people in bondage. And secondly, to imagine that woman's reaction to hear she should have waited. So imagine how she would have felt. Wait, just, just a little bit more. Think about, when have you been told to just wait a little longer? I mean, what was their intention in suggesting that or ordering that for you? Because as Dr. King notes, wait almost always means never. Art and I practiced that a little bit in our raising of lamps when he was a child. We would tell him, we'll see. <laughs> when the real answer was no. <laughs> and after a while, he figured it out, and we had to take that out of our toolbox. <laughs> so I thought about what must be going through this woman's head. Because ironically, she did not go to Jesus to be healed. She didn't ask for this. 
She was simply standing in the crowd, as she likely did every day, bent over. And then the text says, Jesus saw her. Now think about how important it is to be seen. Yes. He called her over and said, you are set free from your ailment. And it's a, it's a beautiful moment. I just imagine when she stands up. The first time in 18 years, and then is criticized that it's one day too early. She might have thought to herself, just as Dr. King wrote from the bondage of his jail cell, for years now I have heard the word wait, and it rings in the ear with a piercing familiarity. So I thought about the, this woman, and I, I, I imagine her sitting in the audience in a hot, humid Alabama sanctuary one night, listening to a sermon by Dr. King and waving her fan and nodding her head in vigorous agreement when he said, we have waited for more than 340 years. We still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining simply the right to have a cup of coffee at a lunch cup. I guess it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of racism to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black, brown, black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech <clears throat> stammering, as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told Fun Town is closed to kids like her, and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to develop in her little mental sky, see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a, a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for your five-year-old son who in agonizing pathos says, Daddy, why do white people treat us so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are harried by day and haunted by night, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never knowing what to expect next, plagued by inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodyness, then you will understand why we find it hard to wait. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. He wrote this in the margins along the sides of the daily newspaper he received while sitting in solitary confinement. So, the results of the vote came in last week. Property owners in the Stapleton neighborhood voted not to change the name in order to keep honoring a man who was a member of the KKK. But he wasn't simply a member of the KKK. He filled his cabinet and police forces, including the chief, with members of the KKK. This was a man whose election to mayor of Denver was celebrated by a cross burning at the top of South Table Mountain. So despite any other accomplishments, Jews, Chinese, Catholics, immigrants, and African Americans were all openly terrorized with impunity during his reign. And people who have recently moved to Denver, you need to Google Stapleton and the Klan and learn how how much influence they had here and around the state. So even decades ago, people 
knew that using his name was a problem, but ultimately nothing was ever done about it, which is given as one reason for not doing anything about it now. So Black Lives Matter brought it back into public discussion in 2015, and I remember thinking, aren't there more pressing issues? But I concluded it wasn't my business to decide what was important to people terrorized by the KKK. Amen? Amen. So an interracial group, including members of our congregation, has been working for the past two years to rename Stapleton for all. They made us see it. And they hoped that when people saw the truth, they would be moved with compassion. Instead, it made people uncomfortable and defensive. All kinds of excuses. Almost funny, the excuses. And then the Master Community Association, they were particularly annoyed by the group, calling them outsiders coming in. If you lived on this side of Quebec, you had no business being involved. They were impatient to get this off their agenda, so they pushed for a vote before everyone was ready. They considered the rename, rename group's uh, concerns overhyped and accused advocates of bad behavior. And then a decision was made to exclude anyone from voting who lived in Stapleton but did not own property. Only property owners could decide this. And who do you suppose is disenfranchised by a decision like that? So no one was surprised by the outcome to keep things the way they are. Because changing would be an inconvenience. So I went to that MCA meeting on Tuesday where the vote would be ratified. Oh man, I was struck by the tones of hostility in the room and offensiveness. That really, I felt like I was sitting in a room in 1950s Birmingham. This 100% white group told the renamed people over and over, you should have done it a different way. <laughs> they had no power to do it another way. I, it was surreal, and we left there feeling just deeply sad trying to process, and will be processing in our, our common room this afternoon from 1 to 2.30. And invite any of you who'd like to come, be supportive, and hear how we continue this in the future. So while all this is going on, you may know from the news, as property owners voted to keep the name Stapleton, students who studied this and saw it removed their name, now call themselves Instead of the Denver School of Science and Technology in Stapleton, it's DSST Montview. You may have seen that Denver Parks and Rec just removed his name from a rec center in Globeville. The Stapleton Foundation changed their name to the Foundation for Sustainable Urban Living. And other groups are starting to drop it, and some business owners are dropping it. And this will continue until the embarrassment for people who live in Stapleton will be too great. And then it will change. This could have been an occasion of enlightenment, a collective, oh, we see it now. Instead, it will fester and we'll wait. So a, a name change may seem trivial compared to issues, for example, of affordable housing in Denver, but the root is still racism. Redlining 60 plus years ago still has generational impacts on the accumulation of wealth. And racism must not just get cut, but it must be pulled up from its roots. Roots planted by the KKK before other issues here can be dealt with. So as I was reading through the letter from Birmingham Jail this week, I came across a passage. I hadn't known what to say to this, this group. And I found this passage that I shared with them to try to console them. Dr. King wrote to the Birmingham clergyman, I had hoped the white moderate would see this injustice. Maybe I was too optimistic. Maybe I expected too much. I guess I should have realized that few members of a race that can oppress other races can understand or appreciate the deep groans and passionate yearnings of those who have been oppressed 
and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers and sisters have grasped the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too small in quantity, but they are big in quality. And I have to say, I think that's good news, that more people have been mobilized. More people of all races now see this issue. 35% of the 35% who voted were enlightened. This bent over woman's life was changed when she was seen by someone. When someone saw her, then she was no longer nobody. And in honor of the Sabbath, not disregard for it, Jesus freed her from her bondage. And that's our legacy as his followers. Jesus taught us to see things. And when we stop looking away, 